Two weeks ago, we began the book of Jonah. We took a hiatus for Mother's Day, and now we're back to Jonah. If you remember two weeks ago, Jonah was given a commission by God to go and preach to the city of Nineveh. But Jonah wanted none of it and refused to do as God had told him to do. And instead of going to Nineveh, he went in the opposite direction. He went to Tarshish, boarded a ship, and set sail. The reason that he was going to Tarshish is that he said that he was seeking to flee the presence of God. He wanted to get away from God and what God would have him to do. This morning, we look at God's response, and we see that he certainly was not successful in fleeing God's presence. But let us work our way through this text, first by noting God's response to Jonah's disobedience. Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah went away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After praying, paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to free from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Three simple statements that caused three consecutive events. First, God sent a great wind, which in turn caused a great storm, which in turn caused the ship to be in danger of its very existence. There is no question that the storm is God's doing. Notice verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. I love the picture of what is taking place. For it says the Lord hurled a great wind. That's a great translation. It's exactly what it means. It's the way a pitcher would throw a baseball. The picture is that here is God in heaven. Here is Jonah going in the opposite direction that God would have him to go. Instead of going to Nineveh, he's headed for Tarshish. He gets on a ship and he's headed for Tarshish. And God sits in heaven and just takes an aim at that ship and throws a mighty wind in their direction. This passage teaches us that God is certainly aware of our actions. He certainly knows our decisions. There is no place that we can flee from God's presence. And God is certainly powerful enough to deal with Jonah's disobedience. We'd like to look at the response to the storm. First, the crew's response to the storm. The crew was afraid in verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid. This was no ordinary storm. The scripture tells us that the ship was in danger of coming apart. It was so shaken, it was so rattled, it was so beaten that the ship was literally coming apart at the seams. And the, the sailors knew that their very lives were in danger. So what did they do? Well, they turned to their gods. Notice verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his god. Each cried out to his god. There is a universal response on the part of the sailors. No matter what their religious belief or affiliation was, each one had a response, and that was to call out to whatever god it was that that particular sailor served. They were not of all one faith, they were not of all one ilk, but they all had the same response, and that was to cry out to their god for help. There was no help. It was to no avail. 
their gods could not help or deliver them. So then the crew did all that they could to save the ship. Verse 5. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. <clears throat> that too was of no avail. So what are we to learn from this? Well, the crew had some spiritual or religious awareness, but their God could not deliver them or save them. Notice Jonah's response to the storm. Jonah's response is that he stands in great contrast to the crew. Again in verse 5, in the middle of the verse, we read the simple statement, but Jonah, but Jonah. The but is a conjunction of contrast. We're to see the difference in the way in which Jonah responds to the sailors. They're afraid, they call out to God. But what does Jonah do? Well, Jonah had gone down into the ship. It tells us in verse 5, he went down into the inner part of the, of the ship. He was unaware of what was taking place, for he was fast asleep at the end of verse 5. This word means a, a very deep, almost hypnotic, hypnotic kind of sleep. He is totally out of it. So then we're introduced to the captain's response. The captain seeks out Jonah, verse 6. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? He rebukes him. How can you be asleep? How can you just lie there? And the captain urges Jonah to pray. Verse 6. Arise. Call out to your God. Get up, man, and pray. Pray to your God. The captain is fully aware that the events are beyond his control. The end of verse 6. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. This was their last hope. This was the last gasp of energy and strength. Jonah, call on your God. Maybe he will hear, maybe we will spare, he will spare us. If the ship is going to be saved, it's going to require some kind of intervention on the part of a deity. Application, it's a somewhat natural response in the time of imminent danger for people to turn to God. It's not uncommon that when death is facing people head on, that all of a sudden people have a tendency to cry out to God. There's an old statement that says there are no atheists in foxholes. That when push comes to shove and your life is on the line, it's not unusual that people cry out to God as they envision him, as they think of him. Even irreligious people pray. It kind of reminds me of the response that people had to Columbine or the events that took place on 9-11. And if you remember, in both instances, our government called upon us to have a day of prayer, of people to call unto God. And you were encouraged to go to your mosque, <laughs> to go to your synagogue, to go to your church, to go to the deity that you profess and call upon him for help so that we will not experience this kind of tragedy again. That's very common. What is striking in this passage is that Jonah does not pray. Even though this captain, this unsaved individual, is telling Jonah, you need to pray, 
if there's going to be any chance of our being delivered, and he refuses to pray. What a rebuke it is to us as believers when people would urge us or call us to pray and we would fail to do so. I just mentioned that there were two days of prayer that were called for, the Columbine shooting, the, the 9-11. I, I wonder, how did you respond to that call? Did you pray in that particular day? Did you ask God to intervene for our country, our nation? How do you respond to the many shootings that have been taking place in school? Do you bring that before God? Right now, there is a lot of talk about how we need to do more than to pray. And uh, that was said by the governor of uh, Texas in response to this latest shooting in Santa Fe. We need to do more than pray. Well, there's a reality to that as well. We do need to do more than pray. We need to tell people about who Jesus is. We need to share the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. We need to talk about how God can change the hearts and lives of individuals. How that which is evil and sinful can become good. We really do need to flesh out for people what they don't know. But at this point, Jonah is silent. So now the sailors confront Jonah. They seek to understand what is the cause of the very unusual storm. Notice verse 7. And they, that's the, the sailors, said one to another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they're looking for an answer. They look at this as no ordinary storm. These are seasoned sailors. And they're saying, they recognize, they construe that this must be the work of a God. And they want to find out, why is this God angry? So they decide to cast lots to find out who brought this storm upon them. God reveals that Jonah is to, is to blame. Verse 7. At the end of the verse it says, For so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. This is not to say that we are to discern the will of God by casting lots. But rather, here we are to see the grace of God to these sailors. He acquiesces to their understanding. He is gracious and reveals to them through the lots that the culprit is Jonah. In the book of Proverbs, it says the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Again, not that we are to use that as a common way of discerning the will of God, <clears throat> but rather to see that, that God is in control of all things. Well, once they find out it's Jonah's fault, then the sailors grill Jonah with a series of questions. Verse 8, they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. This is not a question, this is a statement. Tell us, you, who on account of this evil has come upon us. You troublemaker. <laughs> you problematic person. Tell us, what is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What are your people? What have you done? Why is all of this happening to us? Jonah responds simply, somewhat candidly, Verse 9, he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. So two things we note from what Jonah said at that point. 
First, he identifies himself as a worshiper of Jehovah. I fear the Lord. All capitals refers to the name of Jehovah. And then he identifies this God as the God of heaven. That was a typical Eastern term of the day, the God of heaven. Uh, many false gods also were referred to as the God of heaven. But he goes on to say, he is the God over the sea, he is also the God over dry land. I serve the God who rules this storm. I serve the God who's in control of this wind. And he's not only in control of the sea, but he's also in control of the dry ground. He's in control of it all. And the sailors are terrified by Jonah's disobedience. Verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So their question is, why have you offended this God? Why in the world wouldn't you do what he told you to do? What is going on here? So they want to know the extent and kind of Jonah's disobedience. Verse 10, the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? Explain this to us. For they knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. The sailors then asked Jonah what they should do. Verse 11. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? It's interesting that they take responsibility. They say, what should we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? The issue should have been, what was Jonah to do? It, he was the one to blame. Jonah, what do you have to do for this storm to stop? Instead, they said, what do we have to do? The solution that Jonah offers of being thrown into the sea is quite remarkable. Notice verse 12. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah knows why the storm came. Verse 12, it's because of me. There is no doubt in Jonah's mind that it's the result of his disobedience. He knows that God is at work. And he takes responsibility. This storm has come upon you because of me. But Jonah refuses to repent. Look at verse 12. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. Jonah does not repent. Jonah doesn't say, I will go to Tarshish and this storm will stop. Instead, he says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. The first thing I'd like you to notice is that Jonah, Jonah also does not voluntarily jump into the sea. Jonah is so selfish that he says to these sailors, if you want this sea to stop, then throw me into the sea. Jonah is incredibly selfish in this act. Three things should strike us. First, he is unconcerned for the sailors' physical welfare. He put them in danger. And he's indifferent to that danger. He's unconcerned for their emotional welfare. The trauma of picking him up and throwing him into the sea. 
He could care less about the agony and the heartache he's putting the sailors through. And then thirdly, he has absolutely no concern for the spiritual welfare of these sailors. He says nothing to them about God in a positive light, of putting their faith and trust in him. Well, the solution is unacceptable to the sailors, verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land. This word for rowed hard literally means to dig deeply. Okay? So you can, you can see that their response was a greater resolve. Okay? We got to get to land. That's our only hope. We got to get off these seas. And so now they are rowing furiously. The sweat is pouring off of them. They're working as hard as they can. Verse 13. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. The harder they rowed, the greater the winds and the waves. The more effort they put in, the worse off they were becoming. It was made plain to them that there was no escaping this storm. There was no way out. What we are to see is that these sailors, these unbelievers, show more concern for Jonah than Jonah showed for the sailors. He's the prophet. He's the child of God. He's the one that's supposed to be concerned for others. But they don't want to throw him into the sea. They want to preserve not only their lives, but his life. They don't take that way out. What a rebuke to Jonah. And what a rebuke to us when non-believers show a greater concern for the physical well-being of others than we show. The solution provided a great moral dilemma for the sailors. Verse 14. We see that God is at work in the lives of these sailors. We see the faith that these sailors possess in God. First, it is interesting to see the faith of the sailors in crying out to Jonah's Jonah's God, no longer their own God. Verse 14, therefore they called out to the Lord. Remember earlier, they're each calling out to their own God. Now they're crying out to Jehovah. They believe what Jonah has told them. They believe that it is Jehovah God who brought this storm. They believe it is Jehovah God who rules the seas and the earth. And so they cry out to God. Secondly, they recognize their own accountability to God. Verse 14. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, And then this, and lay not on us innocent blood. Don't hold us accountable for Jonah's death. Forgive us for throwing him into the sea. They don't want to take responsibility. They don't believe it's their place to judge. They don't think it's their place to punish. They're saying, God, forgive us. This man has done nothing against us, but we're going to throw him into the sea. And thirdly, they ascribe power to God. Verse 14, last phrase. O Lord, have done as it pleased you have done as it pleased you. They take this solution 
as coming from God. They believe the word of the prophet Jonah. They believe that if they throw him into the sea, that it will get calm. And so they say, Lord, this is your doing. Do as you please. We will follow your instruction. The difference between Jonah and the sailors is like night and day. So the sailors take the solution that Jonah offered, verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. Now we see that the sailors place their sincere, saving faith and trust in the Lord. They are born again, if you want to use modern day vernacular. For notice what it tells us in verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Notice verse 15 tells us that the sea ceased its raging. It got quiet. It calmed down. Now, they are even more afraid that the storm has subsided. There is a progression in these verses. The first is the sailors feared the storm in verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid. Verse 10, then the sailors feared Jonah's disobedience. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what have you done? And then the sailors feared the Lord himself. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. The English tries to reflect the Hebrew to some degree by saying that the men feared the Lord exceedingly as opposed to saying the men exceedingly feared the Lord, which is what we would normally do in English. The reason is because in the Hebrew, the Lord stands out in the beginning. It's to say it's the Lord that they feared with an exceedingly great fear. Their fear now surpasses anything that they had had previous. Greater than the fear when they thought they were going to die. Greater than the fear when they heard that Jonah had disobeyed their God. Now when they say, saw what this God could do, they feared God exceedingly. It reminds me of the New Testament. When Jesus calms the waters in Mark chapter 4 verse 41... And it says, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? The disciples, when Jesus calms the sea, says, who is this man? Well, now these sailors are saying, who is this God? Even the winds and the seas obey him. Number two, the sailors then offer a sacrifice for themselves to the true God. Verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. And then thirdly, the sailors asserted their allegiance to God and a commitment to serve him. The end of verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The sailors were saved. If you mark up your Bible, I'd encourage you to circle verse 16 and draw, if your Bible's laid out this way, to Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. Or just put a, a note in your margin for Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. Look at Jonah 2 9. These are the words of Jonah when Jonah finally repents. But I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. That's exactly what these men did. They did what Jonah did. When Jonah repented, he offered a sacrifice, and he made a vow. 
That's what they did. They offered a sacrifice and they made vows. They were going to worship and serve this God. What a wonderful and dramatic story of conversion. These men come to faith in God as a result of God's working in this storm. So, some concluding lessons. First, God is able to achieve many different purposes through a single event. God is able to achieve many different purposes through a single event. There's only one storm. But God is at work in the captain, in Jonah, and in the sailors. One event, but God has a purpose in it for each one of those individuals. God is at work in each one of those lives in different ways in the responses that they have to the storm. Nevertheless, it is God who is at work. And we need to see and understand that in any singular event, there is a multitude of activities and purposes and God is at work. Secondly, we're able to see that God is over to, able to overcome our disobedience on many different levels. God eventually will overcome Jonah's rebelliousness. Hasn't done it yet. He still hasn't repented. Now he's going to be in the sea. We'll see what happens next week. But Jonah still hasn't repented. But God was able to bring the sailors to himself in spite of Jonah's disobedience. Again, I think that's so important to realize. The power of conversion lies in God and God alone. God brings people to himself regardless of the people that proclaim his word. So many times I read such things as the effectualness of our proclamation of the gospel depends upon our holiness, our righteousness, the way in which we live our lives. We should live righteous and holy lives. That is true. We should seek to bring honor and glory to God. That is true. But the power of our witness doesn't lie in our holiness. Peter, when he healed the man outside of the temple and said, rise and walk, and then he leaped up and everyone looked at him and wanted to actually worship Peter. Peter said, why do you look on us as though by our power or holiness we have made this man walk? Why are you looking at us? There's nothing special about us. It isn't our power, and it isn't our holiness. In the book of Philippians, Paul said, I rejoice that God is named, whether in truth or in error, I rejoice. There are people who have lived in sin, preachers that have lived in sin, that people get saved under their ministries. For the power lies not in the person who proclaims the word. The power lies in the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not by the righteousness of the one who proclaims it. Jonah is a bad example through this whole passage. Nineveh is going to come to great repentance. But Jonah is still rebellious. Does that mean we should live rebellious lives? Of course not. Of course not. Does that mean that we should not seek to ordain the gospel? Of course not. Does the Bible tell us that we should live consistently with the gospel? Of course it does. But I'm telling you, we can't overthrow the sovereign work of God. God is bigger than we are. God is more powerful than we are. 
And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we are not as godly as we should be. And so when we have the privilege of leading someone to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, let us not take the credit. Let us not look to ourselves and say, look at what a good speaker I am. Look at how holy I am. Look at how dedicated I am. Look at me. No, if someone is converted, look at God. Look at what he does. Look at what he does in spite of ourselves. Look how he overcomes our weakness. Look how he overcomes our rebellion. Look how he overcomes our apathy. God is great. Thirdly, We should not be oblivious to people's situations when in fear and desperation they ask us to pray. One of the great privileges we have as being people of God is that there will be those who know us to be people of God and will ask us to pray for them. Ask us to pray for them. I remember on one occasion, I was at the Hershey Medical Center. I was coming out of the the medical center, and this was some time ago, because I tend not to carry a Bible on me anymore. I I carry my uh, phone and use that as my my Bible, but at that time, I was carrying a Bible. I had it in my hand. And as I was walking out of Hershey Medical Center, someone was hurriedly, it was actually a couple, hurriedly trying to catch up to me and I could get a sense that there was somebody behind me walking quickly and so I stopped and turned around and they said to me, are you a preacher? And I said, well, it happens I am. And they said, well, we thought so because you were carrying a Bible. And they related to me a situation with their daughter and they just said, we don't pray. We don't know how to pray. Would you pray for our daughter? What a grace of God. When people with little or no faith turn to us and say, we're at wit's end. We don't know what to do. Would you pray? another situation in Hershey Medical Center. This time a believer. There was a a person that was in a severe automobile accident. They were very close to death. I was there with the family and the doctor came out to talk with the family just before the procedure. And he looked at me and he said, are you their pastor? I said, yes. He said, come with me. He put scrubs on me and, and a mask and everything. We walked, into the, we walked into the operating room, and there were probably about 25 to 30 people in that operating room with the anesthesiologists and the nurses and all the things for this person was very, very close to death. And the doctor just stopped everybody. He said, we're going to stop. He was obviously the head doctor. He was in control, and he said, this man is going to pray. And he said, if this person is delivered, it's not going to be because of what we do. It's because of what God does. He said, brother, would you pray? I prayed. Unfortunately, eventually the person died. But the person, that doctor, knew. It was beyond their control. What a terrible thing. If in our sinfulness and our rebellion we become apathetic to the way in which our sin hurts others, in the way that our indifference allows us to be unaware of the physical and emotional and spiritual needs of others, you just kind of 
remarkable. That, but Jonah did not think at all about these soldiers, these sailors. All that he put them through. But in the grace of God, they heard enough, they knew enough, and they placed their faith and trust in God. May we be better witnesses than that. May God not have to overcome our disobedience. May God not have to overcome our inconsistencies. May God not have to work in spite of us, but may we gladly render ourselves as useful servants of God to bring him glory. May we want to be used of God. May we want to see other people come to faith. We can agree with the statement that the governor of Texas say, said when it's, we said we need to do more than pray. We need the Lord's help in learning to care about others. We need the Lord's help to overcome our own evil thoughts and desires. We do need to do more than pray. We need to provide people with the hope of the gospel. We need to tell people what the solution is to the ills of our society. We need to talk about how God can transform lives. We need to point people to the comfort of eternal life, of the reality of being born again, and being in a place where there's no more heartache and sinfulness. We need to speak up. We need to tell people what is the source of our hope, what is the source of our confidence, who is our God and what he can do? We can't remain silent. We shouldn't remain silent. We must do more than pray. As I said, Jonah and his sinfulness did not care about others. We must be careful that in our sinfulness we do not become indifferent to others, that we don't see how our sin negatively affects those around us. It blinds us to their needs. It blinds us to their suffering. It blinds us to their turmoil. It blinds us to their spiritual inadequacies. That's what happens when a person is caught up in rebellion in their own sin. They become impervious to the needs of others. But let us rejoice that we have a sovereign God. And there may be many here this morning that are experiencing fallout because of other people's sin, because of other people's indifference. And it may be tearing your family apart. It may be tearing you apart. You may be like that ship I encourage you to call out unto God. God can still work. God can still deliver. God can bring people to repentance. God can save. And God can use us even in our sinfulness to achieve his ends. Let's pray. Almighty God, I pray that you would superintend in our lives. Oh God, that you would arrest us when we go astray. That you would bring us to a place of repentance. I pray that if there are people here this morning that become indifferent to their sinfulness and how it's affecting their families, how it's affecting their friends, how it's affecting their relationships, that Lord, you'd open their eyes to see the emotional and physical and spiritual suffering that they are causing. Oh Lord, I, I pray that we would understand that the God who rules the heavens and the earth, the God who is over the seas, is the God who is over the people. And I pray, oh God, that 
If you would be so pleased as to use us to be an instrument of your grace in the life of someone else, and you'd be so pleased as to use our testimony or the word that we offer to bring someone to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, may we quickly say to ourselves, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us be the glory, but unto thy name. Lord, give us the confidence to share the gospel, not because of who we are, but because of the truth of the gospel, because of the power of your word, because of the working of your spirit. Free us from the bondage of thinking that it relies upon us and give us the glorious freedom to understand that the power of the gospel lies within your kingdom's work and power. You have simply told us to share the word with others. Lord, help us to do that. Give us a a heart of obedience as opposed to a heart that runs away. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we conclude our time of worship together, let's sing God Moves in a Mysterious Way, hymn number 47, again found in your